Well, good morning again, church. It's good to be together, and uh, preaching on Advent doesn't get old, to be honest with you. Uh, it's so much fun to talk about preparing the way. And so what we're going to talk about is a, a personal preparation. Uh, what John the Baptist is talking about is making the valleys lifted up and the mountains made low and making the crooked path straight and making the rough path smooth. And, of course, he's imagining Jesus coming into town. And if someone were coming into town, you would need to bring like a chariot or a wagon. And in order for that to happen, you had to make the paths way uh, straight. And, and the, the message that he's sending, I think, is actually one of joy. It's actually the joy of preparation. And I think that's really a good lesson for all of us to remember that this time of Advent is a time of preparation and joy. Prepare you. Now, um, I thought Spensamaya was the hardest word I was going to say today until we got to this gospel reading. Did you see all of the names in there? You got an emperor, you got a governor, you have three tetrarchs, and you've got two high priests. How can they both be the high priest? Somebody tell me. I don't know. Um, you know, a lot of material looks different depending on how you relate to it. If you were wealthy elite, this is a cool who's who of who's at the party, right? But if you're at the bottom, this is crushing you. And the way Luke writes his gospel, these names of rulers are all of the people who are taking your tax, who are bullying you in the streets, who are oppressing you with their laws and their systems and their gods. This was a headache and a half. And in fact, Luke writes this gospel as Jesus, as, a, as an underdog, as an unlikely character in a world full of bigwigs and leaders. Jesus is a nothing. He's a nobody. He's, he's a backwoods, backwood, uh, backwater kind of guy. And so sometimes when we read this, I, I want you to be able to identify with the crushing weight of what it feels like to have hope in a place that seems hopeless. In fact, the word that we use for wilderness is actually the word for God forsaken. It's, it's not just, you know, I'm out in the wild, you know, I'm going glamping or something like It's not that. It is deserted place, like deserted on purpose because it's not a good place to be. It's, the, it's a place believed to be outside of God's eye. They thought God could see the city of Jerusalem, but, you know, what happens outside of the city stays outside of the city, right? And so the, the idea of a voice crying out in the wilderness is the voice crying out in a place where God can't see or hear you. And so I think that the, that message of who Jesus is going to be is someone for the downtrodden and the lost. Um, most pastors have about two, maybe three Christmas sermons. Uh, this is one of, this is a, a fraction of one of mine that I'm not giving this year. So, you know, you'll forget it by next year. Uh, ultimately, the story of the birth of Jesus is a story of rejection. We, we know this story, right, that in Luke's gospel, just the chapter earlier than what I just read to you about all of those governors, is that Joseph and Mary are going back to Joseph's hometown because the government is making you, requiring you to be part of a, sem- a census, and they don't care that she's pregnant, right? There's, there is no grace, there's only law. And so G- Joseph and Mary are going back And when they get there, there's no room for them. And if you actually think about that story in a deep way, you realize this is Joseph's hometown and he knows everybody. And the reason there's no room for him is because no one will let them in because she is an unwed teenage mother and they don't care. They want to turn their eye away from it. So the story of Mary being born in a barn is not because there were no vacancies in the inn. It's that the city of Joseph's family and hospi- you know, ha- has no hospitality for Mary and her baby. 
It's almost like a beautiful story of where something grows when it's not supposed to. It's like the willing joy of creation where God continues to push us slowly, beautifully, organically, even when we're not ready for it, even when we think that that stump is dead. How many times have you tried to cut something down only for God to resurrect it? That happens to me every single year. And in fact, there's a Bible verse for this. It's from Isaiah. It says, a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. Jesse, of course, is the father of King David. And a branch will bear fruit from its roots. And the idea of God coming into the world of Jesus isn't entirely a new thing so much as a God that's gone underground, a God that's been dormant, and a God that refuses to die. And so John the Baptist starts to see these signs. Indeed, he actually already knows Jesus. He knows that this movement is coming, and he urges us through the years, through the ages, to also prepare for that coming of Jesus. I think our whole lives are actually can be framed in the coming of Jesus again, the second time, the second coming. Um, and it reminds me of a conversation I had really recently at a wedding. Uh, I've been doing a lot of weddings. A lot of people put their weddings off in COVID and uh, decided that in the fall of 2021, COVID was going to be over. Um, so we pushed all of our weddings back then. And uh, it's really interesting um, to be me at a wedding because uh, a lot of people haven't met. Uh, first of all, most people think pastors are born at 55 years old. So uh, that's really fun. Uh, I get to sit with the grandmas a lot of time and they will, they'll tell you everything. They'll tell you all the dirt. I mean, you get, you get like an insider view of everything that's happening. It's like, it's like having the football analyst right sitting next to you on your couch. It's really, it's glorious. And also, uh, after a libation or two, people really ask the pastor some really interesting conversations. And this is one that, that uh, has happened. It's probably the number one conversation that I have, that I have with people outside of my own church. Um, it goes a little something like this, and this was from a good old country boy, and I don't know, there's just a special room in my heart for some good old country boys. I, I don't know, maybe it's my, my upbringing or my childhood, but I just really enjoyed this visit. He's like, um, hey, pastor, I, you know, I, first of all, I loved your message. I thought it was really great, you know, uh, I love it, and, and, and I just have a real, I, I got a question for you. It's just been, it's been tearing me up inside, he said. Uh, all right, what is it? Well, I got this coworker, and I really like him, but he's agnostic. Like, doesn't the Bible say that he's going to hell? And so, you know, I, 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 let, I let him talk for a while so I can sort of gauge where this conversation is going because, he, you know, you, don't, you, you, try, you try and give a little bit without, like, blowing somebody's brain, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm like, well, no, it doesn't. Actually, the word hell's not in the Bible. You've heard me preach on that before. And he goes, well, so does that mean that, like, everyone goes to heaven? And, uh, and I said, well, let me put it this way. You didn't choose to be born into this world, did you? No, that was a gift. That was a gift from God. Well, what makes you think that you choose to be born in the next? And then he asked this, this question, and th this is so just beautifully poignant and, like, I just love how quickly he got to this question here because this is really the question of our Christianity. So what's the point of like, you know, behaving? <laughs> if God loves us unconditionally, like what's the point? Pastor, I'm, there's, there's a lot of pretty bridesmaids at this wedding here. What's the point of like, you know, behaving? Man, I love that question. Anybody else love that question? I love that question. And I said, uh, well, that's the question, isn't it? I would say that behaving is our best way to prepare the way of the Lord, like John the Baptist says to us. 
behaving is the best way that we can prepare the way of the Lord. And I actually love this theology. It comes from C.S. Lewis. You know C.S. Lewis is? Uh, he wrote Lion, Witch, the Wardrobe, but he actually wrote a lot of great theological books a hundred years ago, like this week, if you can believe it. Uh, and one of them is called The Great Divorce, and it's a story about some people who traveled from hell up into heaven. And when they get to heaven from hell on a tiny little bus ride, by the time they get to heaven, they realize that heaven is more solid than they are, that the sun is too bright and the beautiful sound of the birds is too piercing and that what they have to do is gain their strength in order to appreciate and live in heaven. And I think that that is a beautiful analogy for why we, you know, spend time behaving. Because we prepare so that when Jesus gets here, we are ready to go. A bunch of us are going to Greece next year. I was talking to my, my mom and dad are coming on this trip with me. I've been talking to my dad. He goes, he goes you know, it's, it's been a tough year. He's been going through chemo and uh, you know, stuff like that. And, and he said, uh, but I know when I get there, I'm going to want to see it all because I know me. He says, I know me. I know I'm going to want to see it all. And right now I can't. So every day he texts me, I walked two miles today. I walked three miles my wife and our oldest son, as crazy as they are, are running a half marathon in April. All right, she's already signed up, so I can announce it now. There's no, back, no backing down. You think you might prepare for something like that? Say yes. Yeah. My friend Nathan's in seminary because he wants to be a pastor. He wants to be a pastor. You think he might prepare? Say yes. Yeah. My friend Josh wants to buy a new car next year. You think he might prepare for that? This is the Christian life. The Christian life is preparing for Jesus to come back and being ready when he does. And being ready isn't Jesus is coming look busy. It's live the life like Jesus lived his life so that when he comes, we are ready for the kingdom. When the kingdom of God shows up, we are ready. And I'm submitting to you that I don't think that that way that Jesus is going to come into the world is going to be on a dragon or something and just come down out of the sky because the thing we know about preparing for Jesus is that he often comes in places we don't expect. And so the Christian life is to show up in our lives. The best way we prepare for Jesus is to find ourselves in the deserted wilderness and find God growing there. Because Jesus already came once in a backwoods town, in a city that didn't want him, in an empire who couldn't stand him. And a bunch of people missed it. When he comes again, let's know where to look. Amen.